We, we need more than scheduled services. We need more than names on a poster somewhere. We need more than advertisements. We need more than technology. We need more than buildings. We need more than build, uh, uh, programs. We need the move of God. And uh, I believe God wants to move. I believe that with all my heart. As a matter of fact, God kind of left it up to us. He said, draw nigh to God. Amen. And he'll draw nigh to us. And so tonight, I want us to move toward Him. I appreciate this church. And I, I've said it before, man, a hair lit Presbyterian woman preacher can preach at this church. <laughs> Anybody can preach at this church. <laughs> Where's Miss Wendy at? <laughs> It's a great joy, and, and, and I, I appreciate it. I know where I'm at tonight. I know the great church that this is. Uh, I know the great pastor that you have. I know the kind of preaching that you get behind this pulpit every single week, so I do not take that lightly. But tonight, we need God. Yes. And I want to get where God's at, and I want to just hear from heaven. So I want to invite you to take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 5. The Gospel of Mark. Chapter number five. I want us to look at a very familiar passage of scripture this evening, one that we've all have heard preach so many times. And if we're not careful, we'll allow that familiarity to rob us of what God would have us to have for the evening. And so I pray that God would just open our ears to this text as though it's the very first time that we have heard it. And as we come to this familiar passage tonight, I want us to look at verse 21. And pick up in that verse and read about nine or ten verses with the help of the Lord. The Bible says, and when Jesus was passed over again. Let me just say this. I'm glad when Jesus passes by. But I'm glad when he does it again. Amen. Whatever he's done in the past, I'm confident tonight he can do it again. And he wants to do it again. And he will do it again if we ask him. And so the Bible says, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship. And to the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. I'm going to stop right there and make this comment that Mark would have us to see in this text. There are not just hundreds, but there are thousands of people that are thronging Christ. Many people with all kinds of needs and maladies. And indiscretions, many people have come together into this passage of Scripture because they had a need. And so they're pressing toward this blue-collar worker from Nazareth. And the Bible says, and behold, in verse 22, There cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death, I pray thee, Come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him. Again, Mark would have us to see that. Much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things. Notice all these ands in these next couple of verses. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Notice this. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Tonight I want you to look back again with me at verse number 25. And I want you to underline this statement in this very familiar text tonight. The Bible says, and a certain woman, here it is, which had an issue. And I want to preach tonight on this subject. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's got issues. 
Now, if I was a TV preacher, I'd tell you to turn to your neighbor and say, everybody's got issues. But I realize I'm in a Baptist church. You may be sitting beside your issue tonight. <laughs> I realize that we are people that come into the house of God that are overwhelmed and inundated with all the pressing issues of life. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you come from. It does not matter the level of your spiritual maturity. All of us tonight have issues. All of us have issues. This is made apparent by the te text. You could not have two completely different people comparing one another than Jairus and this woman simply known as the woman with the issue of blood. If you look at their lives, you'll discover that they are on polar opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to society. Jairus is a well-known name in his culture. This woman's name is not even mentioned in the text. Right. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. This woman was not even permitted in the synagogue. Jairus was a wealthy man, but this woman had spent everything that she had and was growing worse. Jairus had spent the last 12 years of his life enjoying his daughter, while this woman had spent the last 12 years of her life enduring her disease. Jairus was wealthy, Jairus was popular, and Jairus was famous. This woman was poor, this woman was common, and this woman was unwanted. But at the end of the day, at the beginning of our passage, we know this, both of them had issues. And tonight, all of us in this building, we have issues. Have you ever met anybody that wanted to pretend like they didn't have any issues? Everything in their marriage was fine. Everything in their kids' life were fine. Their church was great. It looked like their job was going well. They didn't ever have any headaches or any stress or any bad days. We've got a word for people like that in Atlanta, Georgia. They're called liars. <laughs> Because I discovered this in over 20-something years of ministry and pastoring nearly 15 years, I am surrounded constantly in my life by people that always have issues. I hear it every single day of my life. Preacher, pray for my family. We're going through some issues. And preacher, pray for my kids. My kids on the, uh, the job's got some issues. And pray for my ministry. We're just going through some issues. Can we just be honest about it tonight? We are a needy people that have all kind of issues in life. I mean, you can talk about all the things that's going on in this woman's life, but the end result and the final verdict is this. It doesn't matter if you're a wealthy, rich ruler of the synagogue, or if you're an unnamed woman to the the following disease, everybody's got issues. But aren't you glad that these same people realize where their issues could be resolved? It doesn't matter who they were or what they was going through brought their issues to the same person. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying for the hope of our country and the blessings of our church and the healing of our land and the revival of our nation, we must turn our face and our heart and our soul and our attention back to the one who can help us with our issues. The Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, I want us to look at this woman as we've looked at her thousands of times. But may the Holy Spirit of God cause our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our heart to sense what this lady is really going through as she's dealing with her issues. Number one, I see in the text the extent of her issues. A lot of times we look at this lady and we just simply say that she's the woman with the issue of blood. But have you ever thought of the magnitude and the force of that condition? And how it has so crippled every area of her life. You could even say tonight that the extent of her issues included this. This was a private issue. The Bible says that it is an issue of the blood. And I'm going to be very honest with you, men of God. Was this not mentioned in the text? As a man of God, I would be very uncomfortable to even discuss what this woman is going through. Right. Amen. We all know that 
this is a hemorrhage of the blood. This is a condition where the blood is constantly flowing. Let me say it very discreetly. This is a female problem. And it's a little uncomfortable to talk about. It's a private issue. Let me say it this way. It's a personal issue. This is not the kind of issue that you stand up in church and say, yeah, I'm going through this. This is not the kind of issue that you would engage in conversation every day with people and say, you know, I'm still going through this thing. No, she does her best like we do. She goes to great measures to try to conceal that thing. She tries to keep it under wraps. She doesn't have a postcard saying what she's going through. She doesn't raise her hand in the prayer meeting. She doesn't talk about this to her pastor. She doesn't tell everybody that she meets and this. No, she's dealing with something very private. Let me say it this way. It's something underneath the surface. It's something that a lot of people can't see. And tonight I believe that's where all of our issues originate. They originate in the deep recesses of our heart and our soul where nobody else knows about. And as independent Baptists, we do a wonderful job of always trying to make this external facade seem like it's where it ought to be. We go to great measures to dress right and talk right and look right and we should. But would you believe this tonight? You can have the best suit that money can buy. You can carry a King James Bible. You can come to church every single day of your life. You can cross all of your T's and dot all of your I's. And at the end of the day, have issues that nobody else knows about. Here's the reality. There are some things that we're going through tonight that maybe our spouse doesn't know about. There's some private issues that we deal with that maybe our pastor doesn't know about. There's some things that we go through that we not dare tell our children about it, but nonetheless, in the midnight hour, there they are. We go to bed with them. We wake up with them. They're always pressing, and the more we clean up, and the more we try, and the more we try to play the part, at the end of the day, that stronghold is on our life, and we're just dealing with issues. Issues all are abounding in our life. I remember so discreetly many years ago when a lady came and wanted some counsel with me and my wife and as we brought her into the office I'm talking about the epitome of fundamentalism. Dressed, the part, sang in the choir, led ministries in our church with the children. I tell you what, she was prim and proper and she was a testimony to so many. And I watched as her face began to flow with tears and she said, Preacher, I'm just struggling with some issues. And she said, Preacher, just a handful of people know about, know about this in my life. She said, but when I was young, my father, he abused me physically and it turned into where he started abusing me relationally. She said, Preacher, I, I left my house as an early teenager and I turned to the world. I sold my body on the street. She said, by the time I was 18 years old, she said, I came up in the family way and I had an abortion. She said, I dealt with so much depression and guilt and anxiety and shame about that. I turned to drugs and I turned to alcohol. She said, the preacher, I'll never forget the day when Jesus came to my father and washed me and cleaned and made me new. She said, the preacher, there's not a day that goes by that I don't deal with these secret things down deep in my heart. She said, Preacher, pray for me. I've got some issues. And tonight, your issues may not be that extent. It may not be that severe. But nonetheless, there they are. And nobody in the world knows about them. They're private issues. Number two, they're not only private issues. They're purity issues. Now, according to Leviticus chapter number 15, verse number 25, this woman is not permitted in the house of God. She's considered like a leper. She's unclean. She's unfit. She is defiled to come into the household of faith. We know that there is a requirement here that she can bring two turtle doves to the high priest and the high priest can offer the sacrifice. And there, once she has been cleansed on that eighth day, separate from her purification, she can go back in and be permitted into the household of faith. But the problem is she's been dealing with this 12 years. Right. And there's not been an eighth day of cleansing. Right. 
So in essence, this condition, let me say it this way, this issue has driven her away from church. Let me say it this way. This issue was more than something that was private. This was an issue that affected her spirituality. Amen. And if we're not careful, we'll allow those issues that we never get resolved, that we keep tucked away somewhere to keep us indifferent with God. I see people everywhere that I go, they got a smile on their face and it seems like they're in their right place in the expected hour, but their heart is far away from God. By the way, you can be in church and not be part of the church. You can sit on the pew and shout amen and your heart be a million miles away from God. You see, this woman had no prayer meetings. This woman had no ladies luncheon. She had no Saturday visitations. She had no revival meetings. She had no choir practice. All of these issues in her life had made her indifferent from the household of faith. What I'm saying tonight, if you're not careful, you'll allow that issue to go unresolved so much to the point that it causes you to be distant from Almighty God. And many people fill our churches that sing amazing grace that are not experiencing the grace that God wants them to have. Purity issues. Past issues. What about the extent? Past issues. You understand? 4,300 days have come and gone. And what she brings in the Mark chapter number 5 is the same thing she's been dealing with 12 years ago. Yes. She keeps dragging her past behind her. She can't shake it. She can't get rid of it. What started 12 years ago, that issue is the same issue she's dealing with here. She can't shake her past. Right. Some of us, right. we allow our past to scare us. Amen. We allow our past to scar us. Yes. Yeah. We allow our past to stump us. Yes. We allow our past to stop us. Amen. And we're not effective in the here and the now because right. we keep living in what right. something happened right. yesterday. There you go. Right. Can I just say this, and this is not part of the message tonight, but if God has forgiven you of your sins, your past is in the past. And we don't let go of it. Why, well, preacher? Because God has. God has washed it under the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And the deacons may remember it, and the courthouse may remember it, and the church may remember it, and your spouse may remember it, but there's a God in heaven. of Jesus Christ. That guy just can't get rid of it. It's going with her everywhere. It's walking with her. It's in every verse. It's in every line. It's in every street. It's in every chair. It's in every home. It's in every day of her life. She just can't shake her past. She's got private issues and purity issues. She's got past issues. She's got physical issues. Now this just seems to be common sense here. This is an issue of the body. This is a health issue. And I believe what she teaches us tonight is something that all of us know. There's a strong correlation between what happens to us in our body and what happens to us in our faith. Let me say it this way. Our physical maladies often translate into a spiritual reality. Yes. No question. Yes, you remember what Paul said? He said that there was a messenger of Satan who came and buffeted me. Right. Afflicted my flesh and gave me a thorn. Paul was not just fighting in his flesh. He was fighting in his faith. Amen. And this woman certainly is struggling with her relationship with God. Now, I remember... When this reality came home to my life. Are you still with me tonight, Savior? Amen. 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 Just talking a little bit this evening. I'm trying to get loosed up for the, Amen. For the week. Amen. I was a 32-year-old pastor in Winder, Georgia. And on a Sunday morning, I woke up with these big welts and scars all over my torso and side. I, I was in the awfulest pain I'd ever been in. 
For two weeks, I felt like I had the flu, but that morning it felt like I had broken ribs on top of the flu, on top of this wellness that had come on my side. I preached that Sunday morning, went to the doctor afterwards, and the doctor said, Mr. Kakadaw, I don't know what you've been doing, I don't know where you've been, but you've got a full-blown case of the shingles. And he asked me this question. He said, have you ever been under any stress? <laughs> and so I got, I got my checklist out. I said, well, number one, I'm a husband. <laughs> number two, I'm a daddy. And number three, I'm the pastor of an independent Baptist church. <laughs> number four, I'm trying to finish up Bible college. Number five, I'm writing a book. Number six, at that time, I was running a construction business. Number seven, I was going door knocking. Yeah, I'm pretty stressed, Doc, now that you mentioned it. Matter of fact, I'm stressed right now, just talking about it all over. <laughs> and he said, well, you're going to have to eliminate some of that stress in your life. These shingles have been caused by your stress. Mark it down, for the next six to eight weeks of my life, I was confined to my house. I couldn't put on a shirt and tie. I couldn't put on a suit. For six weeks, I could not mount my pulpit. For six weeks, I didn't play ball with my boys. For six weeks, I could not be the husband that I needed to be. For six weeks, I didn't go door knocking. For six weeks, I got discouraged. And for the first time, I realized this, whether it's cancer or a common cold, there is a spiritual reality when something happens in our flesh. Amen. Amen. And this woman is not dealing with the matter of the flesh for six to eight weeks. No, she's had this health crisis for 12 long years. Don't you know that Satan has come around just like he did with me and say, if your God really loved you, you wouldn't be in this condition. If you really was cared for by your heavenly Father, you wouldn't be in this circumstance in life. Isn't it amazing how the devil finds out what's going on in your life? And he comes around and does his best to try to discourage you and afflict you and cause you to give up. But I'm glad greater is he that is in me. So she comes into Mark chapter number 5, literally on her last leg. She's got physical issues. I'm talking about the extent of her issues. Past issues, private issues, physical issues. Hold on for this one. People issues. She's got people issues. How do you, how do you say that, preacher? Well, the Bible says she had suffered many things of many physicians. Yeah. Let, let me say it this way. The people that she should have trusted the most, the people that she entrusted her life to, were the ones who let her down. And that will happen if you hang around. Yeah, thank you. Let, let me say this tonight. If we're not careful, we'll allow it and prevent it from causing revival. In Amen. Right. Unresolved issues between one another. And squabbles that go on. It's amazing how disgruntled we get over parking spots. <laughs> it's amazing how upset we get over pew location. Yeah. Independent Baptist way, you got my seat. <laughs> it's amazing what we allow to cause us to be disconnected and despondent with other people. I'll tell you, see, preacher, why is that important? Because if we're not careful. That will cause us not to ever experience the presence of God. Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you got it all with your brother and you bring your gift to the altar, leave that gift on the altar. Yeah. Leave it on the altar and go back and make things right with those that it ain't right with and then come back and talk. You know what? We're trying to worship God when we're out of fellowship yeah. one with another. Amen. Yeah. We're trying to get to the presence of God when we can't stand the people we're trying to do it with. Yeah. And this woman, if she had any excuse not to love people, it was her. All of these men and all of these doctors, they disappointed her. They let her down. They took her money. They robbed her blind. At the end of the day, those who trusted should have been trusted the most were the ones who discouraged her life. People issues. Poverty issues. I mean, it just gets worse. It's been all that you... But here's the pivotal issue. This is where I want to get... This is the pivotal issue. 
is that the woman with the issue is coming down to the last moments of her life. You could even say that if something does not drastically happen in Mark chapter number 5, she may not leave this thing. <coughs> you could even say that the issue is choking the life out of her soul. <coughs> Tonight I wonder if that's the pressing issue of our life. I wonder if those things that we keep hid and tucked and we don't deal with and are unresolved, I wonder, do they cause us just to feel like we're spiritually dying? This woman, she's come to the end. This is the extent. This is the magnitude. This is the severity this woman, before our very eyes, is passing away. But we not only see in our text the extent of her issues, it does pick up here. We also see the end of her issues. Because she leaves this chapter, hallelujah, a whole lot different than the way she came. He said, preacher, what happened? One word, Jesus. It's the same word that all of us need to come to the end of our issues. Just passed away. But she called me Monday. 
And she said, Pastor, can I get it off? He said, it would be my honor if you would come and do the memorial service at my husband's uh, funeral. Now, Jay Wah and her husband were pharmacists. Matter of fact, they taught at the School of Pharmacology about 10 miles down the road from our church. Wow. And she said, Pastor Cotton, all she said, that day, the day of that service, there'll be about three or 400 doctors and pharmacologists and professors and pharmacists in that building. And I want you to come and tell all of them <laughs> what you told me. <laughs> And I'm going to be in the room with hundreds and hundreds of pharmacists. God, what will I say? God gave me a message. Well, Lord, God gave me this message. God's prescription for sin. Hey, well, Lord, did I say God's prescription for sin? I got behind that little podium just nervous and scared to death. All those pharmacists looking at me. And I said, I want to tell you something. All of us in this building, we were sin, sick sinners. And religious can cure us. And good deeds can cure us. And all of the, the things that were brother can cure us. But God on the hill of Calvary. touched him 
and leap from where she's been. And there in the midst of her faith, she has done something that has exercised fully what she needed to do. She touched the hymn. Now they tell us that the hymn is simply just a little tassel on the robe of the rabbi as a reminder that that rabbi should walk in the oracles and the precepts of God. Quite literally, that tassel represents the law of God. So that that rabbi, as he is walking, he is to be reminded that every step he takes, he should model an example for his pupils to walk in the precepts of Almighty God. Amen. His walk should be a righteous walk as it is monitored by God's law. Yes, sir. So get this. As she comes to the end of the hymn, as she comes to the edge of that garment, literally, this picture here is that she's come to the end of the law of God. You can even say that she's come to the end of herself. She's come to the end of her money. She's come to the end of her friends. She's come to the end of her finances. She's come to the end of her religion. She's come to the end of everything in her life. This was it. It was over. This was the end. But little did she know this wasn't the end of it. This was just the beginning. And notice what happens. As soon as she touched the hem of the garment, the Bible says that Jesus perceived that virtue had gone out of him and she was healed of that plague in that hour. I want you to see this. The healing did not come from the garment. Right. Our Pentecostal friends have got it wrong. Right. There is no healing power in a snot rag. Say amen, right? Yes. Amen. amen. There's no healing power in the garment. And Mark makes it emphatic. The Bible says that the virtue came out of Christ. Right. right. It came, I believe in healing. Yes, I do. He's yes. Jehovah Rapha. But I don't believe in all these charlatans that want to throw their coats at choirs and right. bring healing that way. I believe in healing, but I believe in healing because of the healer of Amen. Jesus Christ. And he perceived that virtue had gone out of him. Right. Another step, another step. Right. So when did the miracle take place? The miracle didn't take place when she touched the hymn. The miracle took place when the hymn touched her. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a new song right now. It's called, She Pressed Her Way Through the Crowd Without a Single Word. She bowed herself upon the ground as she held to the skirt. The healing came in Jesus' name. A miracle occurred. The moment that she touched the hymn by faith, the hymn touched her. Amen. That's when the real miracle Amen. took place. Not when she touched the hymn, but when he perceived someone was operating by faith and the hymn touched her. Here's my point tonight. We need His touch. Yeah. We need His help. We need just to bring it to Him. And then I'm done with this. Not just the extent of our issues and the end of our issues, but notice the exchange of our issues. And this is really where this speaks to my heart. As Mark has already said, thousands of people are thronging Christ, but Christ perceives that someone has touched Him differently, is moved by faith. He stops this procession and He says, Who touched me? Disciples say, what do you mean, Lord, who touched you? Everybody's touched you. No, somebody's touched me differently. Yeah. So he calls this woman yeah. into Amen. the midst of this crowd, yeah. and he takes her issues and places it on him, and in exchange, he does some things for her. Amen. What does he do, preacher? Amazingly enough, this could be possibly the greatest thing about this miracle. He gives her his attention. Amen. Amen. As I've already said, Mark has made it clear I mean, we're in a very stressful situation. Jairus' daughter is about to die. The clock is ticking. And everybody around him needs something. But in this text, all of a sudden, verse 25, the lens of heaven yeah. begins focusing upon this unnamed woman in the text. Amen. And Christ stops everything Amen. and fully gives his attention to her. Amen. We'll do that for you tonight. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Let me say this way. He's not too busy. Right. This church is not too crowded. That's right. To where he cannot wholly devote all of his attention. Amen. Just That's right. to you. Yes. 
How can God, with a world full of billions and billions and billions of people, fully devote all of his attention just to me, at the same time doing the same thing to you? One Amen. Answer. He's God. Amen. That's right. Amen. And you know what? We'll grow a little, we'll grow a little tired, won't we? I mean, a service goes on too long, or a preacher preaches too long, or an altar call is given and it's extended and extended. We'll get a little tired. People be in the altar praying and we'll not give them the time that they need, but God never leaves one of His yes, children. Yeah. And tonight, God makes His promise to me and to you. I'll give you all of my teaching this service. Amen. All of it. Amen. 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 Then He does this. He not only gives her His attention, He gives her His affection. And says the one word that she desperately needs to hear, yeah. that word daughter. But because I really think, I like this. Wow. I yeah. really think that she wants to remain hidden in the text because she knows anything she touches becomes defiled. Right. She sits in a chair, it becomes defiled. She wears the garment, it becomes defiled. She touches another person, that person has to come under the law of cleansing. And so maybe she's thinking that Christ, well, glory, is going to rebuke me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe she thinks he's going to scold me. Wow. Maybe I've defiled Christ. Let me ask you a question. How do you defile the spotless Lamb of God? I'll tell you what God does. Well, glory. He sees all of your sin. He sees all of your indifference. Let me say it this way. He sees all of your issues. And He's not bothered by it. But instead, He reminds you, Hey, you're one of my children. just to give you my attention. My little boy, he's, he's in first grade this year. Today was his first day of going to first grade. And, and we all summer we've been trying to get him out of this habit. He, he chews on his shirt. I mean, it's, it's really kind of nasty, just to be honest. <laughs> he's, all, he's got every, every shirt has got a ring of sweat and swab and spit. Snot and boogers. Everything is <laughs> goes down to that shirt. And we've been trying to break him from it. And, and so we told him, you know, you've got to stop doing that. You're going to first grade this year. And, well, I know, Dave, it's just a habit. The other night I was up in the study and I was, I was getting ready for the service Sunday. And, and, and I hear him coming up the steps and I hear him. And I, I know what he's doing. So I just tell him, Carson, you, you better not be sucking on your shirt. Daddy's not going to give you any love tonight and tuck you in the bed. So he, he peeked around the corner, Brother Hayslip. And he just looked at me with his shirt in his mouth and said, Oh, that won't cost you from for loving me, Daddy. <laughs> and he was right. You know what I did? Snot, boogers, slobber, and all. I, well, glory. I picked him up in my arms. I loved on him. I put him in the bed. Why, preacher? He's my son. Yes, he has faults. And yes, he has discrepancies. And yes, he has some issues. And so do you and I. But that does That's not right. stop us from getting into the presence of God and saying, bring him to Jesus tonight. Cast him at his feet and let him love on you for him. And then finally tonight we see he does this. He exchanges these issues and gets her his attention, gives her his affection, and finally gives her his assurance. And I'm done. I promise I'm done. He says, daughter of thy faith hath made thee whole. Amen. Well, I love that word. Amen. Whole. Now, 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 get this. Get this. You see this in the text? You see this order? The Bible says in those previous verses that she's touched the hem of the garment and the hem inside of the hem has touched her and she has perceived in that hour immediately that she was healed of that plague. Amen. She's healed. Yes. But when Jesus finally calls her out and says, daughter thy faith has made thee whole, He's already, according to Mark, has already physically healed her. Do you see that? Yes. Right. Physically, he's already touched and healed her. But when he says, Thy faith has made me whole, this is what he's saying. He said, I'm going to put back every piece of your life. Amen. And that's really what issues are. Issues are little pieces of the big scope of life that just get out of whack. Amen. Preacher, pray for me. I've got an issue on the job. What we really mean to say is this. 
I've got a little issue on the job, a little piece of life that's just out of order. Right. I've got an issue with my family. What we say is there's, just, there's a little piece of my family that's just not right. It's just not whole. And then Jesus comes by. He yeah. says, I don't want to just heal you physically. I'm going to allow you to go back into the temple. Amen. I'm going to let you hear the preacher. Amen. In the midnight hour, I'm going to bring glory to your soul. Amen. All those bitter feelings, I'm going to restore and heal those Amen. people. I'm going to give you peace of mind again. I'm going to give you a new set of garments. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to give you a new name. Yeah. I'm going to make everything that's been wrong in your life. I'm going to restore it and make it right again. Yes. And, and listen, I, I preach this tonight because I want revival. Amen. I want revival for my Amen. life. Amen. But before I can ever experience genuine revival, I've got to get broken before yes. three times. Yes. Holy God, with all of my issues, Amen. raw and dirty and unclean and unfit, and nobody else may even know about it, but if I'm going to experience revival, I've got to bring it to yes. Yes. Why? So He can make it whole. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed tonight. I wonder if you would just agree with me on this one thought. Maybe just slip up your hand and let me know you agree. Richard, would you say, say this truth? If you agree with this, say it. Everybody's got issues. Would you raise your hand if you know that? Tonight, Lord, let God just be here. Little Hayslip is going to come. I want to invite you just to come to this altar tonight. Bring those issues to Stand up here tonight. I don't think I need to add anything to the invitation. You've heard the message tonight, so I'm going to respond. Just bring those issues to the Lord. You know what they are, God knows what they are. Nobody else has to know. Just bring those issues to the Lord. Let's don't let those issues stand in the way of us at revival. Let's don't let those issues stand in the way.
all we've heard from the Word of God. Thank you for your servant. Lord, I pray that throughout this week you'd help us to deal with our issues. And God, that we reach out and touch you. Father, I pray tonight that many of us brought our issues to Jesus and gave them healing. Lord, I thank you for your presence tonight. I thank you, God, for doing exactly what we need tonight. Thank you for a man that minded me. Lord, help us to be better. Lord, I do pray tonight there's so much of this bill of the greatest blood issue of all. They've never been saved. God, you wouldn't let them go to hell. God, that you touch them tonight. Save them by your heartless grace. God, the greatest issue we have is we're a sinner. And we need a Savior. I thank you so much tonight for what we've heard and what we've failed. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name.